Hey guys, Pogo here. Uh, in this video, we're going to be talking about obfuscation, uh, which is a very interesting uh, kind of principle or idea that can be applied to code. So, if you've taken the time to write a very uh, powerful and compelling application, and you uh, you don't want to make it open source, you want to maintain the source code for yourself. Perhaps you want to uh, sell the product. Um, an issue that you could run into is, you know, you distribute the product to all of the people and then they can look at your source code, see exactly what you did, and then copy it and perhaps even improve on it, or at the very least know exactly how everything works and compile their own versions. In other languages, this isn't such a big issue, especially languages that compile down into machine code, uh, but Java is not partially interpreted language. Um, so there is the ability to take um, code that has been exported into a jar file and um, convert it back into readable regular Java code um, instead of Java bytecode. Um, so in this video I'm going to demonstrate how to obfuscate a jar file and the difference between an obfuscated and non-obfuscated jar file. Uh, so first of all, obfuscation, of course, refers to the idea of um, kind of hiding all of your code or really just making your code hard to decipher. Um, so all of these different classes, the classes that aren't part of Java, so this main class and this array searcher class that I made in my example, uh, those can be renamed, and all of these variables, um, you know, like input and s and searcher um, and index, they can all also be renamed, and some certain lines of code can be rewritten, like um, for each loops uh, or for in loops are often rewritten as iterators, so you actually use a, a while loop with an iterator. Um, so it just makes the code more confusing and harder to read, and of course the package names Actually, I'm not sure. I think you can uh, change that setting. Um, but, but it'll make the code harder to read and harder to reverse engineer. And that's really the whole point of it. There are two programs that we are going to use in this video. The first one is called ProGuard. And ProGuard is a program, free program, very nice program that you can use to um, obfuscate your files. So if you have anything... Um, that you want to hide before you distribute it, um, you know, especially if you're selling something, um, then this is a great thing to use. So right here, um, I'm going to go. I'm going to grab the latest version of ProGuard, and I'll put this link in the description to go ahead and download it. Um, 5.2.1 is the latest version at this point. Uh, so it's downloaded, and then the other program uh, that we're going to use is the Java Decompiler JD-GUI. Um, this is a little program you can stick a jar file in, and it will decompile the uh, jar file for you. So we have our uh, programs. I have JD-GUI right in there, and then here is ProGuard. And it is right... There. This is, I believe, what we want to open. Oops. That's not right. Um, did I download the wrong version of ProGuard? Oh, no, wait. What did it just say? Um, okay. There it is. So, um... <clears throat> It is under lib and ProGuard GUI. Awesome. So this is uh, what we're going to actually be using to walk through the obfuscation process. I just want to make sure that it will show up here. Um, so it's loading. And in the meantime, I'm going to show you, uh, actually, we're going to export this. There it is. Perfect. Um, as a jar file. So we're going to come back to that in a second. I have this little project here, Array Searcher. You just enter a bunch of values and calls this add method uh, that sticks them into the array list. 
Uh, and then there's a search, so you just enter a bunch of things to search for, and it will just use a really simple sequential search to find them. So you'll see I added this as a test, then a new line to continue, and then, you know, this is a test, I found all of them, and then I tried H and F, and it didn't find them because they're not in the array. So very, very simple example, uh, but it does have two classes and a bunch of variables and, and stuff. So I'm going to export this as a runnable jar file. And we're going to choose the launch configuration for this. And the export destination, um, we'll just stick it on the desktop corner. Um, and we'll just call it um, uh, OB demo, because I'm going to have a couple of different files. Um, and then you can, of course, export jar files in IntelliJ, which I could just show in another video. So um, let me just try to minimize some of this stuff. So here is the demo. I'm going to make a copy of this um, just because one of them will be uh, obfuscated and one will not. Okay, so let's take a look. Um, First, if I run this in the terminal, uh, it will just run through the program. Uh, I'll just quickly show you that. Java-jar, and I'm going to stick in my file. And you'll see um, it'll just work. It'll say this, you know, te test, and, and whatever. So, so it clearly works. And I'm going to open up JDGUI right here. Um, and... I'm going to just drag it in there, and you'll see here's my jar file, there's the package, um, and then I can look at the classes, um, and you'll see that it does a pretty good job of um, decompiling it. I don't really see any difference here, it's pretty good at it. So even though this was compiled into a jar file, into that uh, Java bytecode, it was able to get right back to where it was before. So uh, clearly this is not good because I could just you know open this up and you'll see how easy it is to um, go back. The only possibly weird thing is it, it uses the word this everywhere which I didn't do. And then also um, the generics obviously don't exist so it has to cast to a string. But otherwise it's really really similar and that could be dangerous for your applications. Um, so let's just put JDGUI down for a second. Um, and now we're going to actually run ProGuard, and we're going to see how this works. So ProGuard is going to um, help us out here, and we'll see. Actually, I think, um, okay, so we want to just stick, so the input, I guess actually we want to input the plane, and we want to output the obfuscated. So I think that'll work. It'll take all of the plain the plain jar and it'll output it to the obfuscated uh, and then there are a bunch of different things uh, I'll just leave them the way that they are and it should work uh, of course we want to do obfuscate right there um, and then all that good stuff I'm just going to ignore all the stuff for now but uh, let's go ahead and say process and it uh, oop, just finished and you'll see um, this is still two kilobytes, it's still the same size, but now we're going to go ahead and open this up. And you'll see that we have the demo obfuscated. This is the, you know, new file here that was just exported. You'll notice that there's main.class and a.class. The main class retains its name because um, for the manifest file it has to know the correct name, um, so maybe you could change it, but uh, you know, that's perfectly fine. So let's look in the main class first, um, because uh, that is uh, that is this right here, and we can actually kind of put them side by side and take a look and see how it did. So it obviously retains the name, and it added this print stream uh, import, so we'll take a look and see. So first of all, um, uh, so the that's interesting. So so you see that um, args was renamed to param array of string, and then it was then set equal to a new scanner, which is quite strange. But I suppose at this point uh, it will work. 
Uh, and then we have Searcher. Searcher was renamed to be called Local A, and it's that A class that we're going to look at in one second. You'll see the string values are obviously the same because, you know, you can't change that. Um, but you'll see we have this doing it says if not str equals parameter of string dot next line dot equals. And you'll see um, that it's actually able to figure out that I set uh, input or str equal to s dot next line. So it actually just compounds that into one line. And then, of course, it'll call this a uh, this a method with the string, which is, um, you know, also something we're going to look at. The a class uh, did a little bit of a better job than this class, um, just because this is a lot of words and things that can't be changed. And you'll see that here uh, a similar thing happened. Um, <clears throat> but overall, it's really not that much different. But all right, let's take a look in the um, a class and see if it did any better. So first of all, uh, the class was declared final um, just because there's no inheritance going on, nothing extends from it, and it was just renamed A. So now you would have to guess that this is an array searcher, theoretically, because you wouldn't know otherwise. And if you had a project with, you know, 30 different files, um, then it would become very hard to decide, you know, what does this A class do? And you have to see, oh, main declares some A, and then here I call the A method in the A class, which then adds a string to an array list, and it gets a lot more confusing. Um, but you'll see, so we have this uh, A method takes in a string, and it calls add, and then we have search, um, which will, of course, do that casting again because... The generics are not there. Um, but again, they do look pretty similar because this is an incredibly simple example. But if you apply this to a bigger project, then you will notice um, that there's a big difference. One great example of this is Minecraft. Um, the Minecraft server files that are included in Craft Bucket and Spigot are, uh, you know, hundreds or possibly thousands, or maybe multiple thousands, of files from all the different packets and, um, you know, different things that manage the game, the entities, the achievements, and everything uh, that manage the game. There are tons of files, and all of their fields are obfuscated. So you'll imagine that in one project, you could have 2,000 methods that are named A, and it becomes incredibly hard to juggle you know, here's class A, oh, here's method A, method A appears everywhere because, you know, everything has the name A, this class is named A, this variable is named A, the method's named A, um, it just makes everything very confusing and very hard to reverse engineer. So if someone were to take a file like this and try to improve it or steal the code and, you know, maybe redistribute it with some minor changes, they'd have a lot harder of a time because they'd have to decipher what exactly everything does. So again, it's not a perfect uh, way to protect your code, um, but it's certainly helpful, and it's incredibly simple to do. I mean, you saw that, um, you know, in about one minute, I downloaded the obfuscation program, and I ran it on a jar file, which took, in turn, one minute to export. So it's definitely very helpful. Um, and you may come across, if you ever try to decompile a jar that you download, some obfuscation. So this is just kind of an explanation of what that is, how to do it to protect your own code, uh, and then kind of a comparison of what it looks like. So just to wrap up, I want to show you guys um, really quickly that it does actually still work. So um, we'll do java-jar ob demo obfuscated. And you'll see, I can say this is a tet, tet, whatever. And then I can write this is a test, is not found, tet is. So there you go. It still does the exact same thing that the other file does. It's just that the code is a lot harder to read and a lot harder to decipher. So that's all for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, as always, subscribe if you want to see more. Comment with what you want to learn. If you like this video, click the like button, and I'll see you guys soon with some more programming. Bye for now.